quiet on set. All right, hi, I'm Barry Nairhus, Professor Nairhus for you guys for natural history class here. We're at the UCI Marsh, also known as the San Joaquin Marsh. This is a natural reserve. This is just kind of an overview of what you see. You see these tall green willows here. They're called black willows. They're associated with the freshwater marsh. What's important about this place that I'm gonna show you is that it's the last remaining freshwater marsh on the coast in Orange County that has um, unique rare species like the western pond turtle, there's endangered clapper rails, the California gnat catcher. So I'm going to show you the different plants and habitats and things that we see there. Okay, so the UCI marsh here, it does have marsh habitat riparian in the willows here, but also it has coastal sage scrub. I don't know if you can hear them, but there are some small little birds in the background here. They're called the California gnat catcher. They're federally threatened. They've lost 75 to 90% of their habitat, mainly from agriculture and then urban development. And now what we're seeing, an increase of habitat destruction is frequent fires. So we're having more and more fires, so the last of their habitat is being burned. They pretty much just live in this habitat from northern Baja to Ventura County in the coast. That's where this habitat exists. You can't see them right now. They're, their call sounds like a small cat meowing. They have a black undertail and a black cap, and they feed mainly on small little insects that they catch in, in uh, the shrubs. Oh, and up here you can see a pair of white-tailed kites. Those are uh, fully protected species. They've, they've lost much of their habitat throughout California. They, uh, they're called the kite because you can see as they're flying into the wind, they really just float around. And that's a pair there. So this might be one of the last pairs left in Orange County. Um, and they, do, they are known to nest here. So it's really an important place for a species like this. They mainly eat small mammals and voles, um, which is a small mammal that lives in grasses and in the marsh. So this, this is a really critical area for them. Back in the 60s and 70s, this was actually a, a duck club that people uh, used to hunt ducks. And, and then uh, in the late 70s, uh, it was purchased by the UC Regents. So you can, you can feel the, you can hear the wind blowing through these willows. You can see the emergent bulrush vegetation growing in the wetland areas. And this really, you can really feel the temperature drop in this area um, where there's a lot of water to lowland. This is actually the, uh, the ancient flow of the San Diego Creek that used to flow right here. It's now channelized and empties into Upper Newport Bay and it drains from the Santa Ana Mountains. The remnant populations of the Western Pond Turtle was from this, this ancient creek flying, flowing through. At this time of year, it's actually dry because we're in uh, late, we're in, actually it's August 1st, so we're in the beginning of August, so it's a dry marsh. In the spring, winter and spring, it could be four feet deep when I walk through these areas. So and you can see in the background there, there's an actual fire going on. So I was talking about with the uh, California gnat catcher's habitat being lost. And in the foreground here, you can see how it's all dry and you can actually see footprints of, uh, of raccoons searching the, the, the marsh for uh, any, any old egg net, eggs from nests and crayfish and frogs and things like that. So you can just see it almost as like a big jungle grassland and that's mostly of a broadleaf cattail, Typha latifolia. All right, so you can actually see a little turtle, western pond turtle poking its head out. Out here you, see, you hear those loud chirps, that's the uh, black knit stilts with those red legs. They're just kind of gleaning the water of any aquatic invertebrates. But uh, in the winter time, this is four feet deep. So I come out and I sample turtles and I've caught up to 50, 50 or 60 turtles in this one pond. That is actually a phalarope that just landed. Phalaropes are actually pelagic birds, which means in the open water. And that bird is a migrant coming down from, from Alaska and coming to the coast here. So we're, it's, we're in the very beginning of migration season and that's a sign that they are, uh, they're not breeding anymore and they're moving south. So phalaropes like open water and they kind of spin in the middle of a pond like it's doing or in the ocean, they're an ocean bird and they just eat little invertebrates. So and in the back over there, you can see there's a family of mallard ducks. Most of those are young uh, mallards that can't fly yet, but they uh, hang out in their family group for protection. So, and then this duck right here is a ruddy duck. It's a diving duck that uh, frequents the marsh. It does nest here and, and lives here year round, so. A lot of wildlife happening right here. 
And one thing else I'd like to point out is you can see we're really on the edge of an urban wildlife interface. This is the last postage stamp of wildlife really in the coastal Irvine area. Um, we're on the border of, of Irvine and Newport and you can see these buildings. The FDA building is that low one to the left and then you got all these buildings, the Google building over here to the right. So this is really the last remaining piece and if you see regions hadn't purchased this for research, we wouldn't have all this wonderful wildlife and habitat that we have today here. All right, so at midsummer here, we're at uh, the heat peak, the, the longest days of sunlight. All the winter and spring water has dried away in this part of the marsh. But that's not the end of the story for the vegetation in the community here. You can see at the bottom, things still germinate and then you, you have an entirely different succession of plants growing. The little broad leaves of cockleburr, the alkali mallow, and there's a native ice plant also that's there called the Sesuvium varicosum. And so there's still habitat there where there's pollinators, there's herbivores, and it's still providing food, shelter, and cover, even though the, uh, the life-giving water has evaporated. So this is one of the plants that are growing in the bottom of the wetlands as they dry in the summer. And you can see that they have this white flower um, where it's still important for um, native bees and native pollinators that are still um, gathering nectar and pollen. So again, this is called alkali mallow, or you can also call it marshmallow. Makes me hungry. Yeah. So some of the weeds are actually edible. This is Swiss chard. I don't know if any of you guys ever go to the uh, market, but um, you know, leafy greens, vitamin K, got your fiber, you know, good and salty. Get my vitamins. That's a black Phoebe. It flew away. There it goes. Black Phoebes are fly catchers. Okay, so, uh, right here, these are actually, so I showed you in the beginning of uh, our walk here, there was um, an old natural marsh that had cattails and bulrush, a lot of emergent vegetation that has been drying. Where we're standing at right now is a restored freshwater marsh that a professor at UC Irvine, he received a grant back in 1998 and restored this in 2000. This is 48 acres of experimental ponds, consisting of about 12 of them. And this one back here, even though it has dried, there still is water that remains and there are a few ducks back there that you can see, ruddy ducks, mallards, grebes. There are some swallows that are over there as well. These are used for classes at UCI, uh, teaching limnology, wetland ecology, water testing, and um, also studying the wildlife that occurs in here. So there are still western pond turtles in these ponds, and this is actually a really important wetland for migratory birds. So twice, twice a year in the fall and the spring, you have migrants coming up and down the coast in the Pacific Flyway. And with all the, the loss of the wetlands in California, which equate to roughly 91%, um, they don't have a lot of places to stop and feed. So here where there's still water that remains, um, these birds can come and, and take a rest and have a stopover on their migration route, whether they're flying north or south, depending on the time of year. So those birds you see right there at the edge of the pond, really what they're called the shore of the pond is literally they're called shore birds. That's what their common name is for the group of birds. As they all fly away, you got the yellow legs, you got a dunlin, and then you have western sandpipers, which is the smallest. All those birds have flown from the Arctic Circle where they actually breed. Can you imagine such a small little bird flying thousands and thousands of miles and how many calories it could take? I mean, I'm barely making it through this walk. It's a tail drag or a, a snake movement, you know? You could see the different types of animals, whether they're rabbits, coyotes. And so this is the way that we can see actually what is moving through here. When you see an X like this in a paw print, that's a coyote and they have nails. So when they have nails in the foreground, you can't really see it on this one, but that X shows you it's a coyote. A bobcat would have an M and not have any nails, right? Because all cats have retractable claws except for the cheetah. Now 
that's really cool. So these are pond turtle eggs. So this is a pond turtle egg. Um, there was probably a nest here that was excavated and, and somebody found it. Some predator, it could be a ground squirrel, it could be a, a raccoon. Um, when you have a hatched pond turtle, the eggshell stays within the nest. They never come out. So right here, what you're seeing is somebody had a meal of uh, pond turtle um, eggs. So raccoons and ground squirrels would be the ones that would do something like this. Good find. This is a this is called southern tar plant. So it's only native to coastal southern California, and it likes disturbed areas like a road like this. So um, it's uh, an endangered plant that we have here in Orange County. Southern tar plant, or southern spikeweed. up here this dry slope um, above the marsh there are these specialized plants that can handle the dry soils with very low rainfall the coastal choya here that you see actually in flower has a magenta flower over there um, has these spines that uh, um, help with heat dispersion so that it doesn't lose too much water during these hot summer days and these and then in the foreground here that you see are the cinnamon seeds of the coastal buckwheat this is a very important flowering plant. As you can see, as these things are flowering in the summer, there are um, pollinators, seed eaters, things like that that you can, um, that are utilizing this habitat. Even though we haven't received any rain since April, we're now in August, these plants still remain green. They're flowering with nectar and providing fruits and seeds for the wildlife around. So this undergrowth story that you have in the riparian that requires a lot of water is the California rose, Rosa Californica. So it has these, these pink, light pink flowers that are flowering in the summertime. So, but they do have thorns and everything and they create a really strong understory that is hard to get through. A lot of birds nest in it. And actually after these flower, they have these red fruits called rose hips that are um, edible. So Native Americans used to collect these and eat these and they're still edible to this day. All right, so this is an invasive plant from Central and South America. It's called castor bean. The genus is Ricinus, and the species name is communist, so Ricinus communis. What's interesting about that is it is these seeds right here, these fruits carry a toxin called ricin. If any of you guys have seen Breaking Bad, that was the, the poison that they used to kill people. So the chemical ricin is used as a biological weapon um, in, in warfare. So they're in these berries in it. And uh, ricin is, uh, I think, one million times more potent than cyanide. So you don't want to be eating it. So this, this is an arborescent shrub, which means like a tree-like shrub. It's called toyon, which is a Native American name. One of the only plants that we have that we still use the Native American name for it. Another name for it is Hollywood. And so the hills of, of Hollywood are covered in toyon. So the, the reason why they called it Hollywood is because these berries around Christmas time become very, very red. And so it looks like Christmas holly, especially with these, um, these serrated like leaves, which we call scalophorous serrated leaves. So the name Hollywood is all named because of this one plant here that's native to Southern California. It's really important that we learn about these things um, because we really can't protect and save things that we don't know. So learning about the different habitats, the different plant types, the little interactions that we had with the whitetail kite, the California gnat catcher, the riparian species and the turtles, we had a whole intermix of different habitats in one little area in 200 acres. So I hope you guys can go out and enjoy and really learn a lot more about this throughout Southern California and beyond while you travel and, and really get to experience this stuff. And so next time you're out hiking, you really can start looking at this stuff and getting to know it. So next time on other field trips, we'll be looking at different sites where we can enjoy different aspects of those habitats as well. Is that a one cutter or? Yeah.